Yeah. Uh, so this is Jason Gordon, Gordy Walker. He is a good buddy and friend of mine. Um, he is currently studying uh, to get his MFA in poetry at the University of Florida and is currently a real assistant for Subtropics. Walker is a recipient of scholarships from Poetry by the Sea, a global conference, and the Westminster University Poetry Conference. His poems have been published in Confrontation, Measure, Poetry South, Broad River Review, and others. That being said, take it away, my dude. Thanks, Haley. It's great to see everybody today. Hope you're doing well. Hope everybody's safe and healthy out here. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the sonnet. Um, you might have received a handout on this uh, sonnet workshop. Um, did everyone have that handout or should I distribute that? Uh, you can go ahead and distribute that. Okay, I'll go ahead and do that real quick. Just give me a couple of minutes here. Let's see. So pretty much whenever um, I'm going to send this attachment through the chat and um, that's what we'll base today's workshop off of. I have a few poems that I've included um, in this, if I can find it. Okay. Was it the handout you sent me? Yeah, it was. Okay, I got it right here. Oh, great, thank you. I have so many files on my desktop that I'm just scrolling through files and uh, yeah. All good. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sounds so, like a creative type. <laughs> I try to be. Um, All right, so I'll go ahead and start reading from the handout and then I'll talk a bit um, off the cuff about sonnets and kind of why I like sonnets so much and why I think you should like sonnets too, <laughs> um, or at least give them a shot. So the sonnet, um, most of us know the sonnet from Shakespeare because he wrote a lot of sonnets. The sonnets weren't always good, but when they were, they were great. Um, so many great poets have added to the tradition of the sonnet. Shakespeare and Petrarch are the foremost um, classical kind of practitioners of the sonnet. Someone that writes a sonnet is termed a sonneteer. Um, or just a poet, but I like the term sonneteer because it it's a little more specific. It means you just you're focused specifically on sonnets. Um, you might have heard the sonnet described as a perfect little song, and indeed it is. It's only 14 lines usually, um, so it's just enough space to write a, a poem and to create a lyrical moment or sometimes even a narrative moment, um, as we'll see in our examples a bit later. So you've got different types of sonnets. You have the Shakespearean, you have the Petrarchan sonnet, and we're gonna focus on those first, but I do wanna kind of gloss the surface of these other types of sonnets too, because we'll talk about some of those as well. Um, so contemporary sonnets compared to traditional sonnets Traditional sonnets use meter and rhyme. Um, contemporary sonnets don't really use that so often. Some do. Um, if you're working with a, uh, if you're reading a formal poet, then they might use meter and rhyme. But for the most part, the trend of sonnets now is to do away with rhyme and meter altogether. We'll talk a bit about that and maybe debate a little bit about that later. Um, it's also important to note that although the traditional sonnet is 14 lines, with the contemporary sonnet, you just as may have 16 lines or 12 lines, it, it can vary. Um, so it's not so much uh, with my 
theory of the sonnet, at least, it's not so much that the sonnet is uh, always has to be 14 lines, always has to rhyme, always has to have a meter. Surely that's important and you want to learn that first. Uh, but once you learn that, you can start to play around with the form. Um, but for, for today, we'll get started with um, Shakespeare. So I want to go ahead and read the Shakespeare sonnet that I have down here in the attachment. Okay, so sonnet 28. This is one that you might have read a long time ago. It's one of the most common Shakespeare sonnets, um, but I wanted to include it just because it is so uh, accessible, I think, even by today's standards. And um, it's just a good sonnet. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair from fair some time declines. By chance, or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe, their eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Okay, so from that sonnet, you can hopefully hear, even though my reading might not have as been um, as dramatic as some readings that are out there on the internet, um, I would say that you can still hear the music in these lines. It's very musical. Every word is very specific. Every word is carefully chosen. There's not one extra syllable in the poem. I would argue. Um, there's not an unnecessary syllable in the poem. So with Shakespeare, we can scan these lines and realize that Shakespeare does use the iambic uh, pattern in his work. An easy line to scan would be line four, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. So let's uh, say that one more time. And some or his lease have all too short a date. So that's iambic pentameter. All right. And we can go through if we want and we can scan the rest of the poem and find out that Shakespeare is writing an iambic pentameter in this poem. Um, so he maintains a certain metrical pattern. He maintains rhythm. He maintains rhyme. He maintains sound throughout the poem, but what makes this poem so strong is unlike some of the contemporary poems, which will gloss over, uh, he doesn't always, um, he doesn't, you know, lose track of the song-like quality of the poem. It doesn't turn into prose. It, it's very much a poem. Um, it has a clear theme. Love is the theme here, um, as are most of the Shakespeare sonnets. So let's go up in the handout to page, let's see, I think it's page two. What to know about the Shakespearean sonnet. Um, this is just kind of what I marked up. If you see anything that you uh, are confused about, just speak up. So the Shakespearean sonnet is going to be 14 lines. Uh, Shakespeare keeps his sonnets, I think, usually to 14 lines. Um, I could be wrong. There might be a couple that are a little longer or something, but I'm pretty sure they're all 14 lines. Um, it's usually going to focus on a single issue or an argument or a theme. The common ones in Shakespeare are love, sex, and death, uh, the classic uh, poetic themes, right? It's going to have a turn. The turn is called the volta. Uh, the Italians came up with that term. 
if you're trying to sound uh, more poetic than the rest of your peers or something, just throw out the Volta. When they're all saying the turn, just say, oh no, that we should call that the Volta. Um, it occurs after line eight or line nine, uh, or on line nine. So after line eight, expect the Volta. It's usually going to have some kind of um, a word like and, then, but, perhaps. Um, these types of words that are going to turn or twist either the theme or the narrative or the lyrical moment in the poem. Um, some people I've, uh, might call that a hinge or something like that. I, I usually just call it the turn. Um, so turns are fun in sonnets. Um, in Shakespeare, they're pretty predictable as far as locating them. It's pretty easy. And contemporary sonnets, the turn isn't always going to be easy to locate. Um, I'm thinking of a sonneteer right now named uh, Willis Barnstone, if you want to write that name down, or I can type it in the chat, actually. So Willis Barnstone actually wrote 500 sonnets and... Um, or 501 sonnets. And I haven't read all of them, but I've been reading them for three years or something on and off. I'll just pick it up and, and read it every once in a while. And he is one of the best contemporary sonneteers who actually um, not only knows how to write in the traditional Shakespearean mode and Petrarchan mode, but also uh, has his own types of sonnets where um, after he perfects the craft, he moves on to manipulate the sonnet and uh, distinguish himself among sonneteers by throwing his turns, and uh, putting his turns in sometimes the most random places that you would just not expect. And that creates a sense of surprise um, but getting back, I don't want to get sidetracked from Shakespeare. Uh, getting back to Shakespeare, a really important uh, thing to notice about this sonnet is the rhyme scheme. If you're writing a Shakespearean sonnet, you have to have the rhyme scheme um, for it to be a proper Shakespearean sonnet. So it's A, B, A, B is the first quatrain. C, B, C, B is the second quatrain, EF, EF is a third quatrain, and then it's going to end on a couplet, and that's going to rhyme GG. Um, so we have, how many rhymes is that? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, like seven different rhymes going on in 14 lines. That's really technical. Um, so don't let the sonnet fool you, even though it's short. It is one of the most challenging forms. Um, it's, a, it's a form that never goes out of style, though. So if you figure out how to write a sonnet, you can write them your whole life, and you don't have to worry about, you know, is this form going to work? Well, yeah, it's going to work because it has hundreds of years backing it up. Um, versus some other forms, I'm not going to name names, but Certain other forms, maybe <laughs> Sestina, uh, not always as versatile. Great forms, wonderful forms. There's been good Sestinas, but I said I wouldn't, I wouldn't ran on other forms. So, but hey, if you're trying to get into form and you want an entryway, don't do the Sestina, do the sonnet. Um, don't do the pantoon, don't do the villanelle uh, until later. It, I would recommend if you haven't written any form, formal poetry, start off with the sonnet because it's forgiving. Um, those other forms aren't too forgiving. Uh, villanelle, if you mess up the repeating lines, you mess up the whole thing. A sonnet, if you mess up one line, it's okay. You can go back and you don't necessarily have to revise the entire poem. You might just revise that one line. Um, so I think personally sonnets are easier to revise than some of these other types of forms. Um, but the rhyme scheme is difficult. 
Uh, the final couplet is also difficult. So that can act as the resolution to the entire sonnet to whatever concepts or argument has been presented in the sonnet. Um, it may resolve the argument or issue, but it might not. It might present, sometimes I've seen sonnets that at the end, uh, they'll present an entirely new um, argument at the very end. But for our purposes with Shakespeare, um, I think he does do a pretty good job of resolving those arguments. Um, so that's the Shakespearean sonnet. I am trying to cover a lot of ground in a short period of time. Does anybody have any questions on the Shakespearean sonnet so far? Okay, good, good. Um, all right, so Petrarchan sonnet, let's move into that. I'll go ahead and read this Petrarchan sonnet, sonnet 131. I'd sing of love in such a novel fashion that from her cruel side, I would draw by force a thousand sighs a day, kindling again in her cold mind a thousand high desires. I'd see her lovely face transform quite often, her eyes grow wet and more compassionate, like one who feels regret when it's too late for causing someone suffering by mistake. And I'd see scarlet roses in the snows, tossed by the breeze, discover ivory that turns to marble those who see it near them. All this I'd do because I do not mind my discontentment in this one short life, but glory rather in my later fame. I don't know about you, but I just find that to be a beautiful sonnet. Um, Petrarch is just as skilled a sonneteer as Shakespeare, even though he is not as well known as Shakespeare. Um, this is an Italian sonnet. So this is different. This isn't um, as easy to start off with, I'd say, I'd argue as the Shakespearean. Because at least in the Shakespearean, you have a tradition in English uh, that you can work with. With the Petrarchan, yeah, you have English sonnets that take on the Petrarchan form, but it just doesn't quite always translate as well. So it's nice when you find um, a really good Petrarchan sonnet. And um, you can see the stanzas are shaped a little differently. Um, it sounds a little different than the Shakespearean sonnet. So let me go up to page two again, and you can follow along. So you'll notice there's a lot of similarities between the Petrarchan sonnet and the Shakespearean sonnet. Um, I'd say the main difference between these two is the tradition uh, that's been developed. So if you go and you read Petrarchan sonnets, you need to maybe compare that to Shakespearean sonnets that have been written, and you'll get a taste of the difference there. It's always best to read sonnets out loud if you're trying to really get the taste of them. Otherwise, you might miss certain sounds that, that you just won't gather. So let's not forget it, or it was the Renaissance poets as well that helped develop the Petrarchan sonnet. It's 14 lines, same as above. Um, number four, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, you know, if you're writing in English, which some of you might write in different languages, and that's awesome. Uh, but if you're writing in English, it's going to be iambic pentameter, usually with Petrarchan. If you're writing in Italian, well, I don't even want to get into that today. <laughs> uh, but you can look into that if that interests you. Uh, the rhyme scheme is different, is way different uh, than the Shakespearean. So you've got an octet and you've got a sestet in this, in this uh, sonnet. So an octet, that's a stanza of eight lines. It's, um, the other one's a stanza of six lines. 
So it's going to be in the octet A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. And then the sestet is going to be C, D, C, D, C, D. Or in the sestet, it might be C, D, E, C, D, E. So, you know, if you want to write a Petrarchan sonnet after today, I would play around with the sestet rhymes and see which uh, scheme, which rhyme scheme works better for you. I'm trying to remember which one I would prefer. I think I prefer the CD, 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 uh, just because <laughs> it's more simple. Um, so yeah, the stanza structure, it, I mean, I say here it can be two quatrains, that's true. It might also just, you might also just combine those into the octet, like I was saying. Um, it's up to you whether you want to split it up. And uh, the sestet, that's the hard part, I think, with the Petrarchan. Um, because, you know, in the Shakespearean, you have the couplet at the end. And something about the GG rhyme, uh, it kind of seals the deal on the poem. So I would argue that the rhyme scheme with the Petrarchan is a little more challenging uh, to, the, to the beginner sonneteer than the Shakespearean. Okay. Um, and personally, I write way more Shakespearean than I do Petrarchan. Um, I just prefer the Shakespearean. I feel like you can get away with more language play in the Shakespearean. And that's going to lead me to the free verse sonnet. If anybody has any um, concerns, uh, just let me know. Any questions? No? Okay. So I promise the whole thing won't be lecture, but I do got to kind of give you the, the scoop. Okay, so the free verse sonnet, I've heard these called pseudo sonnets. I've heard these called um, sonic sonnet-like pieces. I've heard them called a bunch of different terms. I just call them free verse sonnets. Um, it's usually going to maintain the 14 lines. However, this is where it gets a little bit more loose. It could be a little shorter. It could be a little longer. I've seen free verse sonnets that are like 18 lines long. Um, that would be termed an extended sonnet. You might want to write that down. So if you write a, a sonnet that goes past 14 lines, it's an extended sonnet. Another thing with, well, not just free verse sonnets, but also formal contemporary sonnets is that you'll find some poets that use the sonnet as a stanza or as a, a stanza form. So you might have two sonnets, that's a double sonnet, or you might have a crown of sonnets, which is a series of sonnets. Um, that play off of each other or respond to each other or um, interact in a certain way. Okay, so with the free verse sonnet, you have more leeway. You can pretty much do whatever you want as long as you keep the soul of the sonnet in the poem. So, uh, you know, you're trying to maintain, from my view, the, the song-like quality of the sonnet, even if you're writing in prosy free verse, um, you still want it to feel like a little song. Now, something you might, and I think I write about this somewhere in the handout, something you might think about to get, uh, you know, your creative energy going is to think of pop songs because I think pop songs, pop songs are comparable to sonnets. Um, they're usually short. They usually have a verse, chorus, verse, chorus, a predictable kind of form. Um, but sometimes with good pop music, that structure gets turned on its head just like with a good sonnet, sometimes poets turn the structure on its head. Um, 
The free verse sonnets do another thing that is really important to note that the Shakespearean and, and the Petrarchan don't do so much of. It's that they tend to elevate one aspect of the sonnet over other aspects. So if you're reading um, a sonnet by like a language poet or something like that, they're going to elevate strictly the sound over the content. Now with the Shakespearean and the Petrarchan, the content and the sound work hand in hand. Um, the, the content and the sound are balanced in those types of sonnets. The free verse sonnet, you can work in extremities. Um, so you might want to, when you write your free verse sonnet later today in a few minutes, you might want to focus on theme more than anything else. Um, so when you're writing, you're just concentrating on the theme. Um, you know, you might have sound in there, but that's not what you're concentrating on. When I write sonnets these days, I tend to focus on the sound and, uh, but I use kind of the Shakespearean uh, mode to evoke some kind of sense in the poem. Otherwise, the sound is just going to run rampant. Maybe that's what you want, though, as a poet. It's up to you. You get to decide with these types of sonnets. Um, a lot of these contemporary sonnets will prize concept or, uh, yeah, concept over everything. So they might, it might be like a sonnet that it doesn't even look, it's not 14 lines, it doesn't look like a sonnet, blah, 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 but then they've labeled it as a sonnet. So they've taken poetic license to say, no, there's something about this poem that I, as the poet, declare to be sonnet-like, or I declare this to be a sonnet. Um, and, you know, that view might be a little controversial among the poetry community uh, at large, but I'm fine with it, and I think it, it was fine. Um, and, you know, they're going to do away with meter with the free verse sonnets, obviously. So that makes it a lot easier to get started. Um, rhythm might even be done away with. It might basically be prose chopped up into 14 lines. Um, but there's something about it that, that feels like a sonnet, like a ghost of a sonnet or something like that. OK, any questions or concerns on the free verse sonnet? And then we'll talk about the conceptual sonnet real quick. And then I'll read a couple more poems. And then we'll do our generative writing. All right. Conceptual sonnet, um, that's what I call it. There might be a more proper term for that. Uh, but these are sonnets that I've started to see pop up in literary magazines a lot these days. Um, it'll just be any old thing. And they just, again, they just call it a sonnet. And boom, it's a sonnet now. So when you're reading it, so what that does is when you declare a poem a sonnet, um, it evokes the tradition of the sonnet. It puts it in that tradition and it pretty much says to the reader, uh, I'm playing around with this tradition, figure it out and, or whatever. So I've seen prose poems that call themselves sonnets. I still can't figure that out. Um, you know, because I'll be looking for the turn. Where's the turn? It's a prose poem. Okay, that's okay. I can find a turn in a prose poem. You know, if you've ever read a short story, that has a, a twist um, that could pops possibly be a turn in a story, right? Um, so that's kind of the approach I take with a prose poem that might be masquerading as a sonnet. Um, but it's just doesn't, it's hard to figure out. So I have mixed views on these types of sonnets, um, but they're fun. They're usually only recognizable because they're labeled like that though. Um, if they weren't labeled like that, you'd have no idea. So um, I want to go back up to page one and make sure I covered everything. So we've talked about the Shakespearean. We've talked about the Petrarchan sonnet as well. Um, 
I now want to talk a little bit more about the contemporary styles of sonnets. So in the 20th and 21st century, uh, John Ashbery had penned a number of wild sonnets and sonnet-like pieces, most notably in his criminally underrated collection, Shadow Train, which was published in 1981. Um, it's a pretty short book. I recommend everybody read it if you're interested in the sonnet, the contemporary sonnet. It is very Shakespearean. Um, perhaps Ashbery is one of the poets that's closest to the tradition of Shakespeare. Um, though he espouses, for the most part, rhyme and meter, with some, with some exceptions. Um, so his sonnets tend to act, again, like sonnet-like sonnet, sonnet -like pieces or like the ghost of a sonnet. Other poets, um, another criminally underrated sonneteer would be Harry Matthews, who is uh, one of the only American members of the Ulipo group, which is a French group of writers who, and uh, intellectuals and mathematicians who use uh, constraints to produce really far out poems and uh, pieces of writing. Harry Matthews has created just as impressive a sonnets as Ashbery, though perhaps they're harder to memorize. So uh, that could be one reason why uh, they're not as well known, but they're just as good. Um, so you've got the New York School Poets, which that includes Ashbery and a number of other poets. I would suggest looking up that school of poetry. You've got the Ulipo Poets, if you're interested in contemporary uh, sonnets that are cutting edge, I would look into Ulipo. Um, but then there's countless other groups of innovative uh, types of writers who have really pushed the envelope when it comes to that form. That's kind of the left field uh, school of sonnets. Then you also have equally as talented poets like Donald Justice and Anthony Hecht who mastered sonnets, who were working closer uh, to the original traditions um, of the English poets and the Italian poets. And I think it's without question that uh, Justice and Hecht too, they mastered the meter, the rhyme schemes, and the rhythms of the, of the sonnet form. And their poems are gorgeous, though they're not cutting edge usually. Um, they're beautiful poems though. Um, and then jump forward a long, like a, a few years later, several years later, um, and you have some really popular sonneteers like Terrence Hayes and Shane McRae, and you even have uh, Ashley M. Jones, who's from Birmingham, which some of y'all might have read her poetry. Uh, so I would say these types of poets, they're pushing the sonnet in new directions, especially in terms of content, um, which is important because the sonnet can so easily become redundant if we're merely repeating, trying to repeat what Shakespeare did or repeat what Petrarch did that, and you know, Shakespeare, I'm not going to get too into this because it would take a long time, but Shakespeare actually was the most experimental or innovative, whatever word you want to use, cutting edge. I like that better. It sounds like I'm selling something or something. Uh, Shakespeare was the most cutting edge sonneteer. So his, it, he wasn't writing at the time. He wasn't writing like these other poets were. He was doing something different. So before Shakespeare, you've got to realize that there were other sonneteers. We just don't necessarily know much about them because Shakespeare came along and just changed the game. That's why it's the Shakespearean sonnet. There were other little types of sonnets that were you know, forming but then when Shakespeare came into the game, he just, you know, solidified the sonnet as a Shakespearean thing. And a lot of poets after that followed him, followed his lead. Um, 
but don't get it twisted. There were sonnets written before Shakespeare that were different than Shakespeare's sonnets. Shakespeare was innovating when he made that. Um, so I would argue if you're gonna write sonnets in the 21st century, first do study the traditional sonnets, do try to, uh, or do learn how to write Shakespearean, do try to write Petrarchan and write a number of those and they don't have to be the best sonnets in the world or anything, but go ahead and write them. Teach yourself how to do the meter. We don't have enough time to cover that today um, in detail, but teach yourself that. And once you feel comfortable with those, then I would say just jump into the deep end, right? Just jump into the, con the world of contemporary sonnets. And you can go to places like uh, the Poetry Foundation website and just type in sonnet and it should bring up a number of sonnets that you could read. So um, another thing before I get in, before I get into our quick generative exercise, it's important to realize that the sonnet is all about morphing the language, right? We're taking the English language, we're putting it into this form and we're transforming it into something new, something fresh. Um, there's no need with the sonnet, I would argue, to repeat, uh, to just repeat what's already been done over and over again. That's a waste of time. So try to put your own style, your own voice, your own spin onto this form once you've studied it properly. Spend a, spend a number of hours, a number of days, uh, maybe a number of years studying the, the traditional sonnet forms because that's going to do nothing but help you and inform you on these more um, quote unquote innovative forms. And you know what's innovative today is blasé tomorrow. So uh, the poetry world moves so fast today. So let me scroll down, make sure I covered everything. And then, okay, I did want to read real quick a couple of these contemporary sonnets, and then I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> All right, with some writing. So go ahead and get a, a notebook and a pencil ready um, to write, uh, to dash off a sonnet because when I write these, I dash them off. Um, so that's how I'm gonna teach it to y'all. Uh, and you know, that's how Keats did it too. Keats just dashed these things off. You can always revise it later. So I do wanna read the Ashbury sonnet more of same. So from the title, before I even get into it, I just wanna make a note. Uh, this is a sonnet about writing sonnets. Try to avoid the pattern that has been avoided, the avoidance pattern. It's not as easy as it looks. The herring bone is floating eagerly up from the herring to become parquet or whatever suits it. New fractals clamor to be identical to their sisters. Half of them succeed. The others gone on to go on to be provincial floral prints some sleepy but ingenious weaver created halfway through the 18th century. And they never came to life until now. It's like practicing a scale, at once different and never the same. Ask not why we do these things, ask why we find them meaningful. Ask the cuckoo, transfixed in mid-flight between the pagoda and the hermit's Rococo cave. He may tell you. Ask the cuckoo, that's saying, ask the music of the poem, or ask, uh, you know, why does the bird sing? It sings because it sings. Um, so you write sonnets because you write sonnets. That's a good enough reason to write a sonnet. Um, so no one has a reason to avoid it, you know, now. 
I'll read one more. Um, I read the one by Rita Dove at the very end of the document. And the ones I don't read, I would encourage you to read them because I, I tried to pick a variety of contemporary sonnets to kind of show you the range. This not by no means uh, shows the full range. Demeter's Prayer to Hades by Rita Dove. This alone is what I wish for you, knowledge. To understand each desire and its edge, to know we are responsible for the lives we change. No faith comes without cost, no one believes without dying. Now for the first time, the trail you have planted, what ground open to waste, though you dreamed a wealth of flowers. There are no curses, only mirrors hold up to the souls of gods and mortals. And so I give up this fate too. Believe in yourself, go ahead, see where it gets you. All right. So even though that has an ironic ending, I want to sincerely say believe in yourself because here is our generative exercise. We have just enough time. It's gonna take 14 minutes. Pick up your pen, get ready. And I want you to just, if you have to number it one to 14, that's fine. I want it to be, you know, don't worry about syllable count. Don't worry about meter. Just go ahead and see what you get on the page. So we've got 14 minutes. So we'll do a minute per line if you need. All right, let's go.
take about um, seven more minutes if you need it. Is anyone uh, is anyone done with your sonnet? Give me a thumbs up if you are. A little bit, yeah. Okay. I'm not saying it's good. It's just kind of done. Do you want to share? No pressure. <laughs> like I said, I'm not saying it's good, but it doesn't have to be good. You know, this is I wrote one and it's terrible. <laughs> yes. Okay. Don't don't feel um, attacked here. But anyway, <laughs> an exercise without a prompt is this striving student's most feared dream. <laughs> she cannot know what theme to pin, but only scribes the random thought. How can this lesson be overcome? But word vomiting has become a thing. No shrinking back from the task. My sonnet will be born. Maybe ugly, maybe dry, but being is better than not. Null is the essence of defeat. Any words are better here. We cannot edit empty verse, but trying we overcome. That's actually beautiful. Uh, <laughs> much better than the one I wrote, which I will not be sharing. <laughs> that's not fair it was very good um i'm with sophia jason that's not fair okay i guess <laughs> i'll read the one i wrote it's terrible um i just so when i write sonnets i just kind of go stream of consciousness um and it's kind of a joke i guess i am the only one who writes this slow i do what i do because i know what i know i write slow my face is full of grace and snow I entertain the moon's dull glow. I diet on worms and a cup of joe. I don't bathe in Epsom salts. I don't drink barley malt. In fact, I'm never at fault with what I do because I write it, I do it slow like a turtle swimming below the lilies. I really do have so many feelings, but so little time. I don't know why I choose my rhymes, but it's better than taking a climb over there where the mountain's face depresses into a deep and lonely understanding. So I didn't, I didn't um, maintain as much of a steady rhyme scheme as you did, Sophia, but I just kind of uh, just said, just write 14 lines um, and then just stuck to the number. And, you know, oddly enough, if you do just stick to the number of 14 lines, somehow there does end up usually being a turn in there somewhere. It, it might not be in the right spot or the spot you want it to be, but if you stick to the 14 lines, you will get the shell of, of something. Um, it might not be what you want. It might not be, you might not consider it to be good, but it's, hey, it's something, it's on the page, right? Um, so, you know, I would just encourage y'all, um, if you're still writing, that's okay. But I would just encourage y'all before we leave, you know, if you're already showing interest in the sonnet, you're, you're already on the right track. Um, to recap, and I'm going to read from this book, which is a good book to buy. It's called The Making of a Sonnet a Norton anthology uh, edited by Edward Hirsch and Yvonne Boland. So that's a good book to buy for sonnets. Another good book to buy for contemporary sonnets and to see uh, the full scale of the sonnet in a single volume by a single author would be 40 Sonnets by Don Patterson. 40 Sonnets by Don Patterson. And, um, you know, on the handout, I named these two books and I named a couple other ones as well. But I did want to read from uh, the Hirsch and Boland anthology real quick before we break, just to recap. Well, I'll just sum it up. So there's two main types of sonnets, Shakespearean, Petrarchan. The Volta is the turn. Um, you know, it's important to know the difference between the two um 
it's important to figure out how to do the rhyme scheme, even if you don't want to be a rhyming poet. Um, and it's important to learn how to do basic iambic pentameter with sonnets, even if you don't want to write an iambic pentameter uh, your whole life or whatever. It is a good skill to learn for this. Um, and someone in the um, someone mentioned to me earlier privately about uh, Hopkins. Um, so Gerard Manley Hopkins would be uh, Manley Hopkins would be another sonneteer who writes these kind of very idiosyncratic. Uh, cur curtailed sonnets. And they're very musical. Um, he's a great poet, I, um, but I didn't include him just because he's not necessarily a poet that I, that I return to that often. So take my lesson with a grain of salt because you might encounter other sonneteers who are either more strict on the tradition of the sonnet or even more loose than I am with, with that. I'm somewhere in the middle, um, yeah. And I'm moving more toward the experimental sonnets. So if you ever read the dream songs by John Berryman, those are all basically sonnets uh, in the contemporary kind of idiom. Uh, and they're just, they're fantastic, even though controversial and sometimes awful uh, sometimes the content is awful, uh, but as far as the form, he does a really good job, Berryman does, of uh, really morphing the sonnet into something new, and it even feels pretty fresh for even today's standards. Okay, so before we leave, do we have any questions or comments? No? Okay. Well, it was so good to see all of y'all. It's uh, been a Can pleasure. Can I make a comment? May I yes. make a comment? Yes, please okay. do. Yeah, you did. I thought you did a wonderful job. Thank you, Michael. And I want you, because the, the sonnet, you could probably, I don't know, do you teach a course on the sonnet, like a, a, a semester or a quarter of course? The sonnet could be taught for a whole month, you know, the the form itself, the history of it, and then, you know, the generating sonnets itself. Meanwhile, right. I'm glad I attended tonight. It was really interesting. Thank you, Michael. And I remember you from years ago, you read a, a haiku at the top of Wells Fargo, I think it was for- uh, It was a Birmingham, it was a Birmingham yeah, uh, yes, Arts Journal, yes. the Birmingham Arts Journal. Yeah, I think that was maybe next to the last one they did before COVID. I remember that. I thought mm -hmm. you were the same person. Yeah. And um, and I came across a sonnet one time. I don't I don't know where it was. I mean, I know where it was. I can't put my hands on it again. You, have, you may have seen it yourself since you like sonnets. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was 14 lines, but each line was one word. Have you ever seen a sonnet like that? You know, I haven't seen it with one word. That's pretty interesting. I've seen it to where it's maybe like, two or three syllables or words. Um, that sounds cool. I'd have to check that out. I don't know. I don't know where I came across, but I really did because that, that's when I realized such things as these traditional forms, they can't stay the same. I mean, that's that's not making it new as Ezra Pound said. Right. So they had to be, uh, uh, you know, experimented with and revamped, you know, then there's George, Gerard Manley Hopkins, the curtail sonnet, which is an Italian sonnet, but he reduced it to 14 lines. Right. Uh, I mean, to 10 lines, from 14 to 10 lines. And um, anyway, I know the program's over with the, and the workshop's over with, but I, always, you know, you, I thought you did a wonderful job. I appreciate it. I was, I'm glad I could attend tonight. Thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Rachel and Lori, as well, for saying thanks. And everybody that attended, it's it's a pleasure. It's really an honor to be here. And Haley, thank you so much for including me. Um, and, you know, it's just it's just been great to talk about sonnets and nerd out. I could, yes, Michael, I could talk about this for months. Um, I think sonnets are just fascinating for all kinds of reasons. So everybody stay in touch um if you do want to talk to me more about the sonnets i'll give you my uh my gmail down here in the chat if you have any sonnets you want to run by me 
um, and you need a, an, an, a, you know, just a reader who's going to encourage you and whatnot, or if you want a little critique, just let me know. Um, and there's my email right there. I'm always open to talking about sonnets or looking at other people's sonnets. So do reach out if you're interested in that. Um, all right, y'all. Well, I'm going to go get some dinner. It's eight <laughs> o'clock here in Florida. Uh, <laughs> all right, great. Thank you, man. I appreciate yeah. you joining and leading us in that. That's wonderful. And uh, I wound up with 14 lines. So thank you for making me sit down tonight. Um, wonderful. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much.